The webinar is being recorded and all registrants will receive a recording. It will also be posted on our website and on our YouTube channel. And we'll, we are now live on YouTube as well. And I wanna now uh, turn it over to our speakers. I'm gonna introduce first Eric Jamone, who is a senior fellow here at Energy Innovation. He's working closely with the Power Sector Transformation Team, and he is a lead author of both the first and the second Cold Cost Crossover Reports. Then we're gonna be hearing from Mike O'Boyle, who is our Director of Electricity Policy and a co-author of the 2030 Report, Powering America's Clean Economy with UC Berkeley and Grid Lab. And finally, we are very delighted to have with us Dr. Leah Stokes, who is an Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of California, at Santa Barbara and the author of the short of the book, not the short book, the book, Short Circuiting Policy, <laughs> published by Oxford University Press. It's a medium length book, um, a good length, Leah, uh, which was just awarded the Alan Rosenthal Prize from the American Political Science Association. So congratulations to Dr. Leah Stokes. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Eric. Thank you, Sarah. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk today about a report we put out last May, the Coal Cost Crossover. Um, next slide. So the inspiration for this report was a series of really stunning um, price data coming out of Colorado a few years back. And then the latest version of this has seen uh, a, a wind project built for $10.68, a uh, PV project being built for $22 a megawatt hour and a solar plus storage project being built for $30. And this is against uh, power plants that cost 26 to $39 per megawatt hour. Now, these aren't exactly the same because on the right, we're talking about new projects. On the left, we're talking about the running cost. Next slide, please. Recently, we had an announcement from Nevada Energy for 600 megawatts of solar with 480 megawatts of battery storage intended to replace the North Valley Generation Station, a coal plant in Nevada. Uh, we estimate that the cost of running that station is $60 a megawatt hour. And the Nevada Energy didn't announce a price for these solar plus batteries, but we have similar uh, projects. On the left, we're talking about the uh, solar plus um, battery projects have gone for 30 to $40 in Colorado and uh, California. Next slide, please. So the question becomes, how many more deals are there out there where you could replace coal with renewables? And the answer is a lot. And this is what we call the coal cost crossover. Next slide, please. So what is coal cost crossover? Coal cost crossover is basically what we call a transition where the world goes from being cheaper to run coal to where it's cheaper to replace the coal with a new renewable resource. So uh, a few years back, the excitement was about when it was cheaper to build a new renewable than a new coal or gas. But now we're talking about building a cheaper renewable that's cheaper than actually running the coal. Next slide. Now, <clears throat> this project looked at, at the whole US wide fleet of coal plants on, and, and we compared the marginal cost of energy of coal plants to the levelized cost of energy of local renewables. Now, I like to think of something ak this akin to something like a barometer, which measures the air pressure. Barometers won't tell you exactly what's happening in terms of the weather, but they're a really good indicator of what the weather is going to do, especially if you see big changes in the pr air pressure. Next. Now, local renewables, what do we mean by that? For local renewables, we pick these regions that NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Colorado, had used for one of their models called REEDs. Now, the regions you see in color, those are large regions um, that we use to price wind. And then within those regions, you have smaller regions that we use. Oh, I'm sorry, the smaller regions are wind, the larger regions are solar. The reason being solar doesn't vary that much in potential compared to wind. So with wind, you need to be a bit more granular. Next, please. And there were three elements to looking at the marginal cost of, of coal going forward. First is the cost of fuel. How, how much does it cost to actually buy the coal that gets burned? Then there's operation and maintenance. There's some fixed costs, like you know, paying people's salaries, and there's um, variable costs, all this bundled together. 
And then there's going forward capital costs. Basically, every once in a while, you have to invest in the plant to keep it going. And we average that. Next slide, please. And the data that we used is all open source data. We, really, we wanted to create a resource that anybody could use in, in a regulatory proceeding or elsewhere, and also where anybody could just dig into the underlying data. So the underlying data we got from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, the so-called Form 1 steam tables. And we also got data from the Energy Information Agency at the Department of Energy. And putting those together, we were able to collect most of the information we needed. Now, some plants have more information than other, and, and in order to take that into account, we gave confidence tiers. Next. So what results did we get after looking through all that data? Here's a fleet histogram. Now, I know this is a complicated looking figure, but bear with me. So the bars here represent megawatts of coal. And each bar represents a different interval of the cost comparison between coal and renewables. So further left you are, the more expensive coal is relative to renewables. The further right you are, the more expensive renewables are with respect to coal. And then in red, we basically put all the megawatts of coal that are more expensive than local renewables. And that represents 80% of the coal plants and something like 75% of the capacity. Now, this is not an automatic thing. This is kind of a fleet-wide look. Uh, even some of the most attractive, in quotes, coal plants, um, like the one all the way to the right here, are vulnerable to potentially being replaced. In that case, that little blip on the right is the Gerald Gentleman plant in Nebraska. And we hear that some solar developers have been buying land nearby in case it shuts down and they could use the same transmission. Next, please. Now, this was our 2020 report. We had done a previous report with 2018 figures, and it's interesting to contrast the two reports. So on the left here, you have the results from 2018, where we found that 62% of the megawatts in the coal fleet were vulnerable to uh, being replaced by local renewables. And then we anticipated that as renewables kept getting cheaper, by 2025, that figure would be 72%. Now, since then, some of that stuff is retired. That's the dark gray stuff. Some of it's announced retirements, so it's the light gray. And then we've got even more plants that are looking vulnerable to renewables. So we're now at 74.8. So you can see we've really accelerated the, against the trend that we anticipated. We're almost at the 77% already. Next slide, please. And what does the geographic distribution of, of this look like? Well, most Americans leave, live on the east, so this is where most of the plants are. In green, you see all the plants that could be replaced affordably with renewables. In gray, you see the ones that are still uh, economically attractive against renewables. Uh, I'll, I'll point out that the Southeast, we only basically have one or two plants in gray. And um, in the West, also very few plants are economic. The big one there in Colorado is the Comanche plant, and it's really on the cusp. Um, because of the way we did this analysis, we only compared it to very local things. But uh, as you saw from the renewable PPAs that we quoted at the beginning, they're actually much cheaper uh, resources available to Excel Colorado. So even that one we anticipate will need to be shut down. Next slide, please. Now, one, one problem with, with these coal plants is um, they're in utility rate base for vertically integrated utilities. And vertically integrated utilities have been investing in these coal plants. We've seen an increase from 2009 to 2019 of almost 60% in the capital allocated. That represents $36 billion that have gone into the coal um, mortgage, if you will. Um, we, we see restructured plants in the, in the restructured markets also um, still out there that are uneconomic. Um, but those are able to capitalize on capacity markets and things like that to keep them around. But we expect some of those will retire. Next, next slide, sleep. But what does this bad bet on coal mean for coal communities? Well, the coal cost crossover trend is accelerating. So th this is happening faster and faster. For the moment, utilities and generators are holding on to some of these coal assets. So we see that the clip of retirement is still pretty fast. 
Um, but the pure economics of the situation are going to make it untenable to maintain this coal fleet over time. But now, because there are public benefits to retiring coal for public health and, all, and greenhouse gases and all reasons like that, now is a good time for coal communities to think about striking a deal, get, get some support, get some job training, get some tax relief um, while this issue is still kind of live and imbalanced. A few years from now, the utilities won't really be on their side. Next slide, please. So we can clean up the grid and create a better future if we work at retiring these coal plants. In Colorado, we, th there was some legislation that passed that was quite interesting in that it provided transition fund assistance. And very recently we had the largest the, uh, mining union, the United uh, Mine Workers Association, uh, endorsed the Biden energy policies with a focus on an exchange for job training. So there is a way to work with existing the folks that, are, that have given us some of the best years in providing power from the coal sector so that they won't be left behind and everybody can take advantage of the clean energy. Next slide, please. So how do we do that? Well, policy, state utility regulators, they need to start re-examining the ongoing cost of coal and, and ask questions. Do we really need these coal assets? We can look at refinancing uneconomic coal with things like securitization. And some of the benefits, some of the economic benefits, like in Colorado, can be directed to benefit coal communities that are in transition. There's significant opportunities to reinvest in those communities. And finally, we should leverage all source procurement, competitive procurement, so we can really get a sense of what's available out there and get some of those great deals like the ones that Colorado saw. Next slide. Now, is all this an apples to apples comparison? People will talk to you about capacity value, about reliability. Now, coal plants and renewables are not the same. Of course, we haven't talked about pollution here. If you really took into account the health impacts, and I'm not even talking about greenhouse gases, but just the, the, the people dying of heart attacks, the kids with asthma and so on, then none of these coal plants really pencil out. The coal cost crossover is not a detailed study for each plant that you could take to, to utility commission. It's a barometer. It's giving you a sense that we should be scrutinizing this. But you can make detailed studies of the grid and look at what happens if there was no coal. And we, can, and we see studies that, that show that the grid could be cheaper and more reliable without the coal. And in fact, 80% emissions by 2030 is eminently feasible. And on that note, I will hand it off to my colleague, Michael Boyle, to talk about 80%. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, so as Eric alluded to, um, my name is Mike O'Boyle. I'm the Director of Electricity Policy for Energy Innovation, and I'm going to be talking about what it means to enact a meaningful federal clean electricity standard. Um, for our purposes, that means a policy measure enacted by Congress to require electric utilities to invest in and buy certain amounts of zero carbon electricity that increase consistently over time. And after my presentation, Leah will speak to some of the political considerations and policy combinations that are under consideration uh, at the federal level to achieve that. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, I wasn't ready for the next slide, um, but basically, um, I'll be discussing mainly the, the findings of a recent report that we completed in collaboration between Lawrence Berkeley Lab scientists at UC Berkeley, Grid Lab, and Energy Innovation. Um, we used an industry standard open source model developed by NREL to determine what it would take and, and how it would impact the electricity system to reach 80% zero carbon electricity by 2030. Along with that study, which is called the 2030 report, um, Energy Innovation did a deep dive into the other studies. Uh, out there that examine similar trajectories and rapid electricity sector decarbonization, including work by Princeton, Lawrence Berkeley Labs, and Vibrant Clean Energy to understand how our results converge with other rigorous studies, finding um, that there's a lot of commonality between them. Um, the benefits for employment, for public health, for the feasibility, uh, and also the impacts on climate that we found are also being seen in other studies. So, those two companion pieces are available at 2035report.com slash electricity. Um, so I encourage you all to take a look at those if you haven't. Um, so 
you may have noticed that this 80% by 2030 conversation has kind of really kicked up this year. Um, it's a bolder goal than any other, than any US state has adopted, not to mention the federal government. Um, but the reason we're starting to see that ambition really creep up to this level, besides the increasing urgency of the climate crisis, is that we've seen faster than anticipated wind, solar, and battery cost declines in the last 10 years. Because solar and battery costs have fallen 90% in the last 10 years and wind around 70%, we now have a much more optimistic picture about the costs and feasibility of rapid electricity sector decarbonization than we even had three or four years ago. And the modeling is just starting to catch up to this reality because these, these studies, they take time, they often rely on conservative assumptions. And so we're really just starting to see a new picture of what the electricity sector could look like and, and on what timeline we could decarbonize. Next slide. Uh, but it's also become clear that despite those rapid cost declines, we're not gonna get there without strong federal policy. This is because of the inertia in the system, both political and, and financial and institutional. Um, utilities have sunk and continue to sink billions of dollars into fossil plants. Um, and they have proposed over 230 new natural gas plants over the next 10 years. Monopoly utilities, which are generally very conservative organizations, both culturally and um, out of necessity, they only experience competitive pressure on their own terms. Um, and already built plants have a structural advantage. They have low marginal fuel costs built into the economics of those projects. And as Eric alluded to, the environmental costs are not fully recognized as they should be in regulation. So they have an unfair advantage when competing against clean electricity. Next slide. So the key question of our research is, what does it take and how do we get on track for a zero emissions power sector by 2035, which is the explicit goal of the Biden administration uh, and I believe the Democratic Party in the United States. Um, and it's also more or less on track with what we need to do to achieve a safe climate future. Um, next slide. So in this presentation, um, I'll discuss uh, and get into some detail on six positive impacts of an 80% clean electricity standard. Um, and I'll go into detail on each before passing it to Professor Stokes. So. First, we found that a clean electricity standard creates hundreds of thousands of good paying jobs that are evenly distributed throughout the US, so not just concentrated um, in, in states where you might think have good electric, uh, renewable resources. Um, it improves public health, uh, avoiding over 90,000 premature deaths. Uh, it's compatible with a safe climate future. Um, the infrastructure build out required is very ambitious, but it is feasible. And we've looked in detail at what it would take. Um, we have uh, some conviction uh, that it will maintain affordability in the power system, and also that reliability can be maintained and improved through the transition. Next slide. So one of the most significant findings of our research is that an 80% clean electricity standard um, is an economic recovery strategy, and it drives significant investment in all US regions. Um, the slide shows a map where the size of each pie that's hovering over uh, each state indicates the amount of clean energy resources built in each state uh, to meet a federal 80% clean electricity standard. You'll notice there's a significant investment happening in a lot of coal heavy states, including Kentucky, which is number four on the list, uh, South Carolina, Ohio, Missouri, and even Wyoming made the top 15. Um, that means there will be ample opportunities, uh, which we examine in even more detail in the coal cost crossover analysis, to reinvest in clean energy resources as an economic transition strategy for coal reliant communities. Uh, the politics are also relatively good for bipartisanship, despite the sort of tone on Capitol Hill. About 70% of the investment, um, which totaled $1.5 trillion by 2030, actually took place um, in our modeling in red or purple states. Um, different analyses, including one from Princeton and one from Vibrant Clean Energy, also found between 500,000 and a million jobs created by this policy on net. Um, by 2030. 
Uh, and there's also a working paper by Princeton researchers. It dives into the impact of raising wages um, of wind and solar jobs to levels that are actually higher than the average fossil fuel wage on the total cost of the transition. Um, it actually finds that paying uh, a living wage to, to wind and solar um, workers would not meaningfully increase the cost of the transition. So um, labor is a relatively small uh, part of the total cost of wind and solar. And, and so that uh, was a great uh, finding. And that's a core part of the American Jobs Plan as well. So worth considering. Next slide. Um, there are significant public health benefits to consider as well from the policy, um, which is significant because the air pollution burden imposed by the power sector, which comes mostly from coal-fired power plants, uh, is disproportionately impacting historically marginalized communities, including communities of color. Um, an 80% clean electricity standard avoids $1.7 trillion in health and environmental damages, um, and it avoids 93,000 premature deaths by 2050 in our research. Um, it also takes power sector NOx and SOx emissions, uh, which are leading uh, agitators to public health uh, in combination with PM 2.5, uh, down to 90% lower than today's levels for NOx and 98% lower than today's levels for SOx. So um, really meaningful, rapid reductions in air pollution from the power sector from this policy. Next slide. So the rate of infrastructure build out, I would say is probably the, the biggest challenge um, and the, the biggest constraint to, to meeting this policy, but um, there's significant evidence to suggest that it's actually achievable. Um, and of course the US has done big things rapidly before like building out the interstate highway system, uh, electrifying rural America, over a similar timeline, um, getting setting a person to the moon. Um, but requiring the, the policy requires at least doubling our record wind and solar annual build out, which actually occurred last year. So we're headed in the right direction. Um, but we see from the dotted line on the graph, there are plenty of resources in the interconnection queues, which is kind of the, the, the line that resources have to get in before they actually um, connect to the transmission system. There's plenty of resources there um, to support the pace of development. So, so the maturity, the industry, the supply chain, the availability of capital, these are not the main constraints. Um, the main constraints are actually gonna be you know, local opposition and transmission availability. So um, later on, I talk a little bit about the federal policies that we need to overcome some of these barriers. Um, it's worth noting that our modeling at least suggested that we don't need new natural gas um, to, to achieve an 80% clean electricity standard either. So were we to pass this policy um, for reliability's sake, we don't need new natural gas. So, um, and we also didn't need any of the existing coal. So all coal retired in our analysis. Um, uh, so we can do it reliably with the existing gas fleet. Um, also, our model did allow new carbon capture and storage and nuclear to be built as an option, but the model didn't select any because they were too expensive. So for those concerned about those resources um, competing and, and qualifying under a CES, at least our modeling showed that there, there really had no chance um, uh, on, a, on a cost basis. Uh, next slide. Um, sort of the final finding I wanted to highlight was that electricity is expected to remain affordable but the cost of inaction is untenable. Um, our modeling found that at least the wholesale component of electricity costs would remain relatively close to today's levels. Um, although we didn't look at the transmission system in detail, um, that's a really encouraging finding uh, due really largely to the falling cost of wind, solar, and batteries. Um, but the if you look at the true cost of the electricity system by including environmental costs, you see that it's it, there's really no uh, no competition. Um, costs are total societal costs are about thirty percent lower with an eighty percent CES than they would be under business as usual today. Uh, next slide. So um, the key policy that the federal government uh, would need to pass to to realize this 
vision is an 80% clean electricity standard by 2030. Uh, but there are a suite of complementary policies that are really important as well um, that can enable the, the grid to rapidly transition. Um, I'm not going to go through them all, but um, some need to address environmental justice and pollution standards um, to keep supporting clean energy and research in new um, emerging technologies that can help us get from 80% to 100%. Um, FERC has a huge role to play in building out the transmission system and, and fixing some of the bottlenecks to, um, to transmission development, uh, as does DOE. Um, so I think uh, that's the end of my presentation. Um, and I will kick it to Professor Stokes. Thank you for joining us, Leah. Oh, it's so wonderful to be here. You know, I've been very inspired by the work that Energy Innovation has been doing on this coal um, cost crossover stuff for years, actually. Now, I think I write about it in my book. And um, I think it's very inspiring to sort of understand what do we mean when the electricity system is expensive or what does it mean to be uh, cost competitive? Sometimes when I share this work on Twitter, people will reply, well, how if it's cheaper to build wind and solar, how can we just have them built it? Because they don't understand how the Public Utility Commission process works and that just because it's cheaper doesn't mean it's in the utility's interest and doesn't mean that it's approved by public utility commissioners. So uh, I think it's really powerful powerful work uh, that, that you have been doing. So I just want to highlight some of the facts um, that uh, have been raised by Eric and Mike and talk about what's going on at the federal and even a little bit the state level to try to address these challenges. So I think, you know, one thing that Eric talked about, which is so stunning, which is a fact that uh, I know, but I hadn't heard the number, is that there's been $36 billion put into coal plants since 2009. Wow, what a crazy number. You know, you might be like, why? Why are they doing this? Well, basically, when the mercury rule was finalized, the mercury air toxic standard around 2011, uh, there was a push for utilities to make a decision. Were they going to retrofit coal plants and put new control technology on them? Or were they going to shut them down? And a lot of utilities decided to keep coal plants open. Keep in mind what we knew about climate change at that time, what the utility industry knew about climate change at that time. They probably should have shut down these coal plants, let alone what they knew about public health impacts but they didn't and that was rather tragic because now we have this debt problem. And you don't have to take it from any of us, you can take it from the CEO of Nextera who said a couple months ago, there's not a single regulated coal plant left in this country that's economic, meaning that's cheaper than the alternative, like wind and solar, um, full stop period. That's, that's what he said. So there's so many coal plants right now that aren't really in great financial shape. And honestly, utilities don't really know what to do about this problem. I think that creates some opportunity, but it's a tragic situation that we found ourselves in. And it's particularly tragic because we're seeing, as Mike said, 230 new gas plants being proposed by electric utilities right now. This is on top of, I believe, about 100 gigawatts that they've built over the previous decade. And um, I wrote a report with the Sierra Club about this uh, called The Dirty Truth, which looked at the gap between what utilities say they want to do from a climate perspective with their pledges and the reality of the massive amounts of new gas infrastructure that they're building or proposing to build. And it's important to remember that just like these coal plants have all this debt that we have to deal with, if we build these gas plants, it's not realistic to think that we're going to run them long enough to pay down their capital costs and their debt. Uh, you know, there's been a whole conversation with Duke and the amount of gas that they're proposing. And I think in their most recent filing, they've said that they plan to operate a gas plant for eight years. Well, that's less time than most people own a car for. It's just not realistic to think that you're going to build a gas plant and shut it down in eight years and there's not going to be any financial impacts on rate payers. So we should be learning the lesson from this coal plant debt problem in the gas area and we should stop building new gas plants that are going to become stranded and create a whole new financial problem for us down the line. 
Um, and you know, this isn't just tragic from a ratepayer perspective or from a health perspective. The fact is that some public utility commissions are actually rejecting new proposals for renewables, for cheaper renewables, because they're saying that there's enough capacity. So we're in a pretty tough spot right now with the system as it is. And I think even some utilities understand that the system as it is isn't working and they need policy to change it. So for example, in Missouri and Kansas in the past couple months, there was bipartisan legislation that passed to use this coal plant securitization idea that Eric introduced, which is basically a way uh, kind of like refinancing your house at a lower mortgage rate to pay down the debt and help shut down the coal plant earlier. And, and that was passed you know, in fairly Republican places in a bipartisan way with support of utilities. Um, as was also mentioned, both Colorado and New Mexico have also passed these coal plant securitization bills. And what's really important about those precedents, even if the policies aren't perfect, is that they also include money for communities in transition so that, you know, some of the savings from shutting down this coal plant, literal just cost savings, not even all the health savings or, or environmental savings, some of the, those savings go towards community funds that can help communities in transition when these coal plants shut down. So that's what's happening at the state level. But obviously, right now with the American Jobs Plan, we have a huge opportunity to scale this up because states don't have the power of the purse in the way that the federal government does. They can't really spend money in the same way. And so all these ideas that are happening at the state level, like clean electricity standards, like coal plant securitization or debt forgiveness, all of that can be scaled up federally. And that's really the opportunity we have for ourselves. So I'm going to focus in on the clean electricity standard, but I just want to point out that the clean electricity standard, as Mike was saying, is not the whole thing. It's part of a package uh, throughout the power sector and also, of course, in transportation, buildings, heavy industry, lots of other sectors to clean up our economy. And in the power sector, there are a couple really important things. There's, of course, the clean electricity standard targeting 80% clean by 2030. And I'm going to talk more about that. But there's also a discussion about extending critical tax credits for wind and solar, what we call the ITC or investment tax credit and the production tax credit or PTC. These tax credits have historically been tax credits, meaning that they're very hard for a lot of utilities to access because a lot of utilities don't have a lot of federal tax liability or any tax liability whatsoever if they're a nonprofit like co-ops and municipal utilities. And so the idea is let's extend these tax credits, but let's turn them into a direct pay mechanism. And that's a really important idea because it means that utilities can rate base and profit off of building renewables in the same way that they have been historically rate basing and profiting off of dirty fossil investments. So that means that there's not going to be the same uh, trade off where utility says we've got to take our capital out of coal and put it in gas. How about they take their capital out of coal and put it in wind and solar and batteries? That would be a lot better. So by tweaking that policy and how uh, it basically making it kind of more like a grant, not just a tax credit, it makes it more likely that utilities are going to be able to participate and figure out ways that they can profit off of the transition. In addition, another key component is uh, getting rid of some of the debt in these coal plants. Um, that can be built into a clean electricity standard, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but it can also come specifically for rural electric co-ops that own a fair amount of this coal plant debt through the Rural Utility Service. This is a, a program by which uh, rural electric co-ops can borrow money. Now, only about half of co-ops have used this mechanism, so it's not perfect, but it is one way that the federal government can address some of the coal plant debt problem. And I would say too, much like we've seen in this precedent of Colorado and New Mexico, we really need investment in economies in transition. These communities that have been historically involved in coal mining or have a coal plant located there or some kind of fossil fuel uh, based workforce. We need funding to help those communities transition and really have good paying jobs. And the federal government has the kind of scale of resources that it could put towards that. That could also come, uh, for example, through a clean electricity standard, if it preferentially says, let's put new clean projects in historically carbon intensive areas. So that's the big picture. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about the clean electricity standard. So as Mike was saying, a clean electricity standard is a policy that's been pioneered at the state level. And the basic idea is you set a target and a timetable. So you say we're going to have 80% clean power by 2030. So most uh, actually 
more than one in three people in this country are already living in a place that is targeting 100% clean power. So we know this idea works. There are clean electricity standards in many states across the country and even some territories um, and in DC. And so this is something that we know works. It's not like a new idea that we're not sure if it's gonna work. When we do it at the federal level, it's gonna work slightly differently than at the state level, because again, the federal government has money. So rather than just saying, you're gonna have 80% clean by 2030, the way the clean electricity standard could work, particularly if it's passed under budget reconciliation, is that the federal government could be a co-investor in this transition. It could say, hey, utilities, you need some resources, some capitals in order to build out this new clean stuff, build out that transmission that's so critical to breaking those bottlenecks that Mike talked about in terms of the interconnection queues. You need some money to retire that coal plant debt that Eric talked about. You need some money to do energy efficiency programs. Great. We're going to help you do all those things. The only thing you have to do in to get this capital infusion and this co-investment from the federal government is build clean power at the pace and scale that's necessary. So if you're adding clean power at the right pace and scale, the federal government's going to help you pay for it. And that's going to be very important because we don't want utility bills to be going up during this period of high capital turnover. So we've got to get rid of the debt in the coal plants, right? We've got to build out this clean energy stuff. When we do this in the long run, what work from Energy Innovation and their partners at Berkeley shows is that the power system will be cheaper. But getting from here to there could involve upward pressure on rates because of these terrible decisions like the $36 billion that's been put into coal plants. And so what the federal government can do is help ease that transition financially and make sure that bills are not going up in this transition period so that at the end of it, bills can be falling actually. So how can we do this? Of course, bills can be passed in Congress through what's called regular order. That requires it to be bipartisan because in the Senate, you need to have 60 votes in order to avoid the filibuster. We've obviously seen for the past, I don't know, month or so that there have been efforts to do a bipartisan uh, infrastructure bill. None of them have included almost anything on the power sector, let alone a, a clean electricity standard. So it's not really an approach that seems to be working to be doing what we need at the pace and scale that's necessary. Uh, it can also be done, of course, by getting rid of the filibuster, but we've seen that several senators are not comfortable doing that. But the critical thing is that this can still be accomplished through the budget reconciliation process, which just needs 50 votes, which we have 50 Democratic senators, and then the vice president would cast that last vote. Um, and like I said, when we do it through budget reconciliation, it shifts the policy slightly to be more of an investment-centered policy that actually provides a lot of benefits. You know, we can see this as a challenge that, oh gosh, it's so hard to pass this bill, but we can also see it as an opportunity that by tweaking the bill at the federal level, making a clean electricity standard more like a investment program, that that actually has a lot of benefits where the federal government can be a partner in, with states, with utilities, with rate payers, everyday citizens, and help with this transition. Okay, so do we need this policy? I think Mike did a great job of explaining it, but yes, we really do. If all we do is extend the tax credits for renewables, which I fully support, that's great. It will make wind and solar the cheapest resource. But if we don't also pass the clean electricity standard, what we're seeing from the modeling is that we'll be running in place a lot because some of our clean power will be retiring under that system. And so we might only move from about 40% clean power today to maybe 44% in 2030, maybe 56%, not a big jump and certainly not the 80% we need. So what we really need is those tax credit extensions to make wind and solar by far the cheapest resource in every single place. So Eric showed you some places where without this additional support, we're getting really crazy cheap wind and solar, but we need that everywhere. And that's what the tax credits do. And then we combine that with the clean electricity standard and boom, it means that we're gonna build massive amounts of wind and solar at the pace and scale that's necessary. Of course, we're gonna also have to invest in transmission and other things, but that can be done with this investment centered approach in the power sector. Mike already gave you some of the amazing benefits that this will deliver. There's independent modeling. There's the data that he showed about what that will deliver in pollution reduction, but NRDC has also been doing modeling and showing that 80% target by 2030 will cut CO2 from the power sector 86%. That means it'll deliver more than half of our target for that 50% economy-wide cut by 2030 that Biden has talked about, right? 
So huge. Cleaning up the power sector is like getting us halfway to our Paris commitment. I will also do massive things, as Mike talked about, for NOx and SOx. In this modeling, we showed that the 80% clean by 2030 gets 93% reduction in SOx, 76% reduction in, in NOx. And as we've seen with this amazing work from Energy Innovation, it's going to avoid more than $1.7 trillion in environmental and health costs. That's just mind-blowing. Think about all the people who are picking up the tab for our energy system by getting asthma and having to go to the hospital and having to pay out of pocket, you know, because they don't have very good health care in the system. We have pushed the cost of our energy transition onto low income people, onto people of color, literally embedding the costs of the transition into bodies of poor people and people of color in this country. And we've also seen from this amazing work from Energy Innovation that this is going to boost our economy. You saw what Mike showed that this 80% target is going to drive 1.5 trillion in new clean energy investments. And it's going to do it in every state in this country and a lot in Republican and purple states, right? And the reality is this is a really popular approach. There's very strong support. Data for Progress has been polling this extensively. I'm talking like 20,000 people have been asked. That's very large for polling data. Normally it's like 2,000 if that. And by a two to one margin, voters like this idea. So we find 62% of support in support. And for the Democrats who are the ones who are supposed to do this, it's over 80% support in this policy. It's particularly popular amongst young people, people of color and Democrats. So that's kind of the state of politics in terms of this policy right now and why it's so critical. And I really hope that folks who feel excited about this can think about what can I do to get the American Jobs Plan over the finish line? What can I do to get the power sector cleaned up? Because this is a huge opportunity that we face this summer and we can't sort of like just stall at the 100 yard line or whatever the right sports metaphor is, which I'm definitely butchering because I'm not really in the sports, but we are so close to getting this done and it would be absolutely transformative if we did. Thank you so much, Dr. Stokes. And I wanna open it up for questions now. We've got a lot of great questions coming in. And just a reminder to look down at the bottom of your screen and you'll see a Q&A box and that's where you can type your questions or vote up a question. So our top question right now is from Marianne Lavelle who is with Inside Climate News. And Eric, this one's for you. And she's asking in the markets that you discussed do you know what the cost of the new natural gas and existing natural gas is? And in other words, won't some of these uneconomic coal plants, won't some of these uneconomic coal plants actually get replaced with natural gas in areas where gas is cheaper and there's no policy favoring renewables? Are you able to unmute yourself, Eric? Yeah. You okay. Yeah, well, thank you for the question. Uh, well, that's a very important question because as Leah said, there's a lot of potential new gas on the table. Now, the study we talked about was operating costs for existing fossil plants versus new wind and solar. So a new gas is still a pretty expensive source of energy. Uh, typically you're talking $40, $60 a megawatt hour. And uh, a lot of the projects that we were looking at in our study were more in the $20, $30 on the renewable side. Um, now, Generation assets bring more than energy. They also bring capacity, the ability to generate electricity when there's peak demand and things like that. But um, allies like the Rocky Mountain Institute, RMI, have done studies that show that we could put together clean portfolios. And so now we're not looking at just renewables, we're looking at demand side management, we're looking at batteries, and that in many cases, we can do the job with those cheaper and better than we could with new gas or existing coal. Um, but that, that goes beyond the scope of the coal cost crossover, but it is definitely within the scope of the 2035 study and the 2030 study that um, Michael talked about, which really examined the full power model uh, in more detail to see the opportunity that's there. I just have one thing to add to that, which is just a, an actual example of where this took place, um, which was in uh, PNM, Public Service Company in New Mexico, um, they, in replacing the San Juan um, coal generating station, had a sort of all source um, procurement where the utility assembled a portfolio of clean resources and gas. Um, it involved, I think, 300 megawatts of new gas, but, um, you know, that was their preferred portfolio. Uh, but a closer look at um, sort of renewable economics and, and 
portfolio assembly um, done by GridLab and some advocates in the region actually showed they could do it at the same cost with no new natural gas, just by relying more on demand side resources, on more wind, solar, and batteries, and, and a little bit on leaning on their neighbors. Um, they could avoid building any of that gas and it wouldn't increase costs. So we're already doing it today. And it's worth noting that gas today is kind of, I see it where coal was 10, 15 years ago, where it's just a bad bet with all the emerging clean technologies and the cost trajectory that they're on. Um, you know, I think the stranded asset risk is significant. Yeah, and remember, there's a difference between what the best economic decision is, not just in this moment, but as Mike was saying, the stranded cost risk and what a utility wants to do. And part of the reason why a utility wants to build a gas plant over some of these other solutions is because they know how to rate base it and profit from it, right? If they put capital into this new gas plant, they can say, this is my expenditure, and then they can get a rate of return through this regulated public utility commission rate making process of 10%. If they instead sign a power purchasing agreement with a wind and solar third party developer, in the vast majority of states, they don't get to rate pace that, they don't get to make profits off of it. And so we have to think about how can we change the system at the state level so that there's some kind of co-incentive where utilities, even if they don't own the underlying wind and solar asset, they can still make profits off of it. And at the federal level, with these tax credits being turned into direct pay, there's more of an incentive and ability for them to build the wind and solar in the first place. So just because they're building it doesn't actually mean it's the cheapest resource or the best resource. They could be building it because it's the best resource for them from a financial perspective, given the current incentives in the system. Another incentive, Leah, is uh, often they own the gas distribution system and they get even higher returns on gas pipelines and gas infrastructure. So they see that as another way to pad their profit. Margin. When you have the integrated gas and electric utilities, that's right. The next question is from Rodney Sobin, and this is also directed towards Eric, but it's great to hear from everybody. So did the coal cost crossover study include transmission needs and costs? There can be good opportunities in some cases for renewables at coal generation sites to use existing transmission capabilities, which would also support local community transition. Yeah, so it's a very good question. I think we had a feeling that a lot of people understood renewables as some kind of like distant resource out in the plains that had to be shipped in on big AC lines. And it's true that there are some great opportunities there. But what really was startling was when you looked at the resource just everywhere on a more local basis, how much there was available. So we didn't look too much at the cost of extra spur lines um, and so on. We were really looking at this kind of the energy part of the story. So sometimes that, that worked against renewables. So one of these zones might be targeted around the city of St. Louis. Well, you're not gonna put a wind farm in the middle of St. Louis, but a little bit of transmission will get you a really nice project just east of St. Louis or just west. And transmission is a really key issue. We, we, we need to be able to interconnect these projects, not just far away, but even more close by. And there's a lot of projects waiting in the queue. Um, and part of what the, the American Jobs Plan will do is unlock the potential for these projects by unlocking the, the transmission that you need to put them in place. Yes, and you know, one of the things that the federal CES could do is say, we want to particularly incentivize projects being built where dirty infrastructure is being retired because of that existing infrastructure that Eric was talking about, the transmission distribution system. And so we could say, we'll give you extra money if you build projects here. That's not just great from sort of reusing our infrastructure perspective. It's also really great from an uh, economies and transition energy transition perspective, because those are places that have historically been employed people in the fossil fuel economy and we want them to feel like there's going to be real jobs that are good paying jobs in the clean energy economy and one way to do that is to actually be directing projects into these places as we turn over this dirty infrastructure that's right and one thing that's important to understand about renewables is because they have a variable output they don't necessarily create the energy exactly when you want it but one way to deal with that is to produce more than you need so that when you want it, you have it. And then the rest of the time you have this excess, the excess energy. Now imagine that you have a project in Nebraska or Illinois that has this excess energy. That excess energy can go into other parts of the economy to make 
uh, uh, hydrogen or even ammonia for, for the agriculture sector. And if you put these projects near the existing infrastructure for coal, you have access to the interstate highway system, you have access to water, you have access to the transmission line. So there's a lot of potential for serious rural development around these projects. So it's not just the dollars that are going into making the electricity, the replacement electricity, it could also stimulate a whole other part of the economy in these rural locations. I'm going to pose a question now that was emailed to us from Albert Lynn. And the question is, what are the best studies to counter the claims that savings from renewables is not adequate enough to address reliability and resource adequacy? Whoever wants to take it. Maybe that's a mic question. <laughs> Which studies are basically the best counter arguments to, to ours? Yeah. What are the best, no, what are the best studies to counter the claims that savings from renewables is not adequate enough to address reliability and resource adequacy? Well, um, besides ours, I, <laughs> uh, I think, you know, um, there have been a few good studies to consider um, besides just ours, uh, which does use, um, you know, I would say, uh, industry standard modeling. Um, but, you know, I, I think any savvy technical expert can point holes, poke holes in, in any of these studies, right? I mean, to really model the grid as it is on a really highly granular basis um, for the entire United States is, is such a resource intensive effort. Um, but a few studies have come out that, that start to put the pieces together to, to form a lot of good counter arguments. Um, one is from Princeton, the Net Zero America study, um, which uh, does a in a lot more detail than ours, shows kind of the interaction between land availability um, and renewables uh, and, and, and goes a lot deeper on say, the electrification of other parts of the economy and decarbonization of other parts of the economy um, although we did look in detail at transportation electrification. Um, another study and, and actually growing body of work are, are the, are the analyses by Vibrant Clean Energy, um, which uh, is chaired by a former NOAA scientist named uh, Chris Clack. Um, those studies uh, go, I would say, into more granular detail modeling weather data um, and understanding the variability of wind and solar and how it interacts with variable demand. Um, as well as I would say a more detailed model on, on the transmission side. Um, and then there's the LA100 study that NREL did um, that showed uh, the largest municipal utility in the country, L LA uh, Department of Water and Power, a pathway to reach 100% um, clean or zero carbon energy uh, by 2035. So that's on pace with President Biden's goal and the American Jobs Plan. Um, that was a study that took years and, and you know, many millions of dollars. Um, uh, so a very detailed analysis of pathways to achieve 100% clean electricity and kind of a, a, a standard um, that I think other studies will, will seek to meet in, in demonstrating that clearly. So there are studies that, that show this. And if you put them all together for the, for the different ways that they need the problem, the picture becomes sort of clearer and clearer that we can do this uh, reliably, but I would say, you know, um, I have a lot of confidence, but of course more analysis could be done to, to improve that. And I would just add that, you know, a lot of the reliability problems we've seen in the last year, whether it's the California power outages in last August or the Texas power outages throughout the year, really, because they've had a lot of trouble. Actually, what the analysis shows is that it's being driven by the gas system, not by, you know, renewables, and that the gas system itself is quite vulnerable under a changing climate. When we have heat waves, when we have these extreme events, it's tending to disrupt the gas uh, supply chain or the gas infrastructure itself. For example, in California, gas plants can't operate when it gets too hot, and we're seeing more and more of these extreme heat waves across the western United States. So I think we also have to look at what's the reliability problem with the current system, and it appears to be uh, fossil gas that is the reliability problem. Yeah, I, I would add to that just to poke on to another um, highly rated question on the Q&A about distributed resources. 
um, we, we didn't analyze those for coal cost crossover and, and not as much in, in the 2035 report, but there was a December report by Vibrant Clean Energy that looked at incorporating distributed energy resources. And what that showed is that's a really an and question. We wanna do utility and DER. And when we do utility and DER, we get to where we need to go faster, cheaper, and better. Um, and Vibrant Clean Energy also looked at the role of uh, wind in the in the Texas uh, freeze that we saw a few months ago. And what was interesting there is that so long as we interconnect between neighbors, so as long as we have the transmission, the, the stress in the system that comes from having a little less wind during part of a storm is actually fairly brief on the order of a few hours, as opposed to losing a fossil plant for a few days. And, and so with the right connection and, and DERs and batteries and so on, actually the, the system that they'd used to study the DER system in December, they, they took that same mix and they said, how would that have done in the Texas uh, event? And they found that it would have done quite well. Uh, and similarly, the, the clean portfolios that RMI has talked about for replacing coal really look at in, introducing demand side and energy efficiency and all these things are part of the pack. We definitely want to do all those things, especially energy efficiency. Uh, so even though we just took a look at the wholesale power part of the comparison between renewables and coal, we, we see that as part of a global strategy that does include distributed resources. I just want to add that I totally agree with what Eric said. The fact is that a clean, renewable, distributed system that's more flexible on the demand side is actually more likely to be resilient, not less likely to be resilient. Because for example, if you have a, a car, an electric vehicle sitting in your driveway, that is fundamentally a giant battery. And once we have the integration with the vehicle to grid, that'll be a way that people, if they have an outage can have backup, let alone if they have a local uh, storage in their home or solar on their roof. And so looking at clean energy can actually be a more resilient system in the medium term than the current system that's based on these centralized plants that can go down because of extreme weather. We have one more minute left, so we can try to take one more question, which is from Ron Lair, and that's our state utility commissions recognizing the differences in risk profiles for utilities that are making the transition from clean to cleaner and cheaper fuels. And if you wanna also just have any other final thoughts for us before we close out. I'll well, say, as somebody who studied public utility commissions a lot in this book, Short Circuiting Policy, that I don't feel that the, the amazing work that Energy Innovation, Vibrant Clean Energy, the Princeton Net Zero's Americas Project, so many other amazing studies like the LADWP, the 2035 report, I don't feel like that's really trickled down into public utility commissions yet and into the way they understand the problem. And partially that's because it hasn't fully trickled down into utilities yet and utilities tend to be extremely influential to understate the issue at public utility commissions. And so I think that there's more work to do to to inform commissioners about the new technologies that we have, how much cheaper they are, because what we're seeing is these integrated resource plans go through these commissions that are gas, 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 gas. And that is not really the best way forward, uh, given all the things we talked about today. I, mean, I would add to that two things. One is federal policy, like the clean energy standard. You have to think of something as that as aligning state policy along really more rational direction. We're not asking for them to do something that is not good for their uh, constituents and consumers. We're asking for them to do something that's better and giving them support to do it. The other thing to keep in mind is some states are doing better than others. Some commissions are doing better than others. And, and so one can be disappointed at the ones that don't, but you can also take inspiration from that. If, if, if Indiana can make the jump, well, why not its neighbors? So wherever you live, you have a chance to push the agenda forward at your state, at your commission. The final thing I would add um, to Ron's question is that um, you know investors are starting to ref are, to get smart and push utilities away from investing in new fossil resources, recognizing the way that climate change actually exacerbates the risk uh, to their entire portfolio of investments. So um, Morgan Stanley issued a report last year called "The Next Wave of Clean Energy." They actually evaluated companies that um, had already made the trend or were already leading on the clean energy transition um, at a higher earnings per share multiplier um, than peers um, and also identified some laggards that 
were they to accelerate the change, they would res it would result in a higher valuation. So this is literally translating into a higher stock price from investors. And no, public utility commissions are not getting it. Um, and they're also not getting that if they allow their utilities to make these poor decisions, they're actually going to end up exacerbating and increasing the cost of capital for those utilities, which then gets passed through to customers. So, um, you know, while right now it might look good uh, economically to invest in gas, I think there it creates a lot of pressure and and problems down the line that aren't getting integrated into long term decision making, and public utility commissions need to wake up to that. So. It's a great way to end this event. Thank you so much, Eric and Mike, and especially Dr. Leah Stokes for joining us. Thank you everybody for taking time out of your very busy day to join us for this conversation. And like we said, the recording will be online. So please share it with your friends and colleagues. And also you can sign up for our newsletter at the link I just posted in the chat. So thank you so much. We hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you all. Thank you.